This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Thank you for joining us today for our Healthy You webinar series on preventing falls through balance and safety. Please enter any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many as we can within the time allotted. I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Lori Ginsberg. Lori is the program director for the Katz Institute for Women's Health at Northwell Health. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Adelphi University, cum laude, her Master of Arts from New York University with honors, and is a member of Sigma Theta Tau, the International Honor Society of Nursing. Lori is a certified master trainer for Stepping On, an evidence-based fall prevention program, Living Healthy, Stanford University's Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, and Homeland Security's Stop the Bleed program. She strongly believes in the power of people to promote their own health and enhance their well-being. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So the title of this program is Leaves Are Supposed to Fall, People Aren't. Next slide. So this is really not a talk about balance, but if you have fallen several or more times, please discuss this with your healthcare professional and tell them about it. Next slide. If you do fall in any case, please go to an emergency room, especially if you are on blood thinners and if you hit your head because you could have an internal bleed that people don't see and you might feel totally fine. Like Vanessa Redgrave's daughter, Natasha Richardson, went on a trip with her family. She fell during, while she was skiing, she hit her head, she got up, she felt perfectly fine. And then the next day she died. So please, if you hit your head, please go to an emergency room, even if you feel fine, because you can have an internal bleed that nobody knows about, and that's the only way to detect it. Next slide. So this is sort of a holistic approach to falls, and many falls can be avoided by thinking more about the things that we do every day. This talk is designed to make you aware of the hazards that are around you. If you can't avoid them, try to figure out how to change them. We're going to talk about it from a multifactorial approach, meaning that we will talk about it from home safety, gate safety, community safety, medication, vision. So we're gonna cover an awful lot. And hopefully when you are finished, when we are finished, you will have some greater confidence in being able to reduce your own risk of falling. So I think Betty Davis said it the best, old age and no place for sissies. And boy, was she right. So what is exactly the problem? Because anyone can fall at any age, but each year, more than one out of four adults over the age of 65 fall. Each of these injuries can cause a very serious injury, like a fracture, a broken bone, or a traumatic brain injury. Falls is the number one reason that older adults go to the emergency room for injury, and it is also the number one cause of injury death. But why are we so concerned about it besides that? Is that very often a fall frequently marks the end of our independence. So did you know that more than half of all falls occur inside the home? And most people think that inside the home that you would fall mostly in the bathroom or the bedroom or the kitchen. But the real answer is that most falls occur in the walkways. 
not exactly in the living room or in the kitchen, but walking from the kitchen to the bedroom, from the kitchen to the living room, from the living room to the bathroom, because people have clutter and we don't realize it, we don't pay attention, we're not aware of it, so it's the walkways. And most falls do occur between 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. because that's really the time when we're most active. We get up in the morning, we have a cup of coffee, we read the paper, by the time we're really starting our day, it's around 10, 11 o'clock. So when we're most active is when most falls do occur. So what are the risk factors for falling? Well, as we grow older, our risk of falling becomes greater. So our age is a great risk factor. Declining strength and endurance, we lose muscle strength significantly every 10 years, every decade after the age of 30, and even faster after the age of 60. Our balance and our gait, many people walk incorrectly and they look down at their feet while they're walking, but we're gonna get into that a little bit later. Um, blood pressure that drops too much when you go from lying down to sitting or you change position. That's called postural hypotension that can make us dizzy and fall. Foot problems that cause pain or deformities. Unsafe footwear like backless shoes or high heels. Eyesight, hearing, and reflexes might not be as sharp. Medical conditions such as diabetes or heart disease or problems with your thyroid or your blood vessels all can cause problems that cause you to fall, that will make you more likely to fall. Some medications that we're on can make you feel sleepy or dizzy or combinations of medications. Osteoporosis, weakening bones can break without warning. There was a study that came out that said a woman broke her hip and the question was, did she fall and break her hip? or did she break her hip and then fall? So the answer is, you know, it's the chicken and the, and the egg, which came first. Sometimes we're not really sure when it comes to bones. And safety hazards in our home and community, but most falls are caused by a combination of risk factors. The more risk factors we have, the greater our risk of falling. Next slide. So, Falls also take a tremendous psychological toll, and there's something called fear of falling that affects many, many people, and they stop their social and physical activities. So what happens is, when you have a fear of falling, you're afraid to go out, you're afraid that you're gonna fall, so you're more likely to stay home. And if you stay home, you limit your activities in the home. You sit around more, you're not as active anymore, and then your muscles weaken with lack of activity and they can atrophy, they can get very, very weak, and those weakened muscles can actually cause you to fall. So even the psychological toll is a very big risk factor. Next slide. So that was all the bad news. And there's always good news, there's always a silver lining in the cloud, and the truth is that there is good news, and your balance and your strength can be improved at any age, and your fall risk can be lowered at any age. Fall is not an inescapable part of aging, and you have the power to control your risk of falls or a significant part of it. You know, you see um, Dr. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and you see if you saw her documentary that she works out in a gym three times a week with a trainer doing push-ups and strengthening activities. And that's one of the reasons that she recovers so well from her illnesses and that she is so physically fit. Next slide. So the first thing we're going to talk about is awareness, gait, and movement. So let's talk about walking. Walking really is a finely tuned ballet. And it's a ballet of scanning your surroundings and heel-toe walking. Heel toe walking. Next slide, please. So when you are walking, one of the most important things that you can do is you pay attention to the big picture. You need to be aware of your surroundings. Many people, when they walk, they look down at their feet because they're afraid they're gonna trip over something right in front of them. But you really need to walk like you drive. So when you drive, 
you don't look just at the first car in front of you. You look at the cars way ahead. You see what the traffic is like. You look to the sides. You look all around. You're aware of everything that's around you when you're driving. And that's what you do need to do when you walk so that you can look for things that might trip you up, things that are coming in your way, things that are on the sidewalk, so you're aware of them and you can avoid them. So how do we do that and walk safely? We scan ahead every 10 to 15 feet for hazards that might trip you up. So you scan for anything that might be in your way, you prepare for it. If there's nothing in your way, you just keep walking, and when you approach that 10 to 15 feet, you scan again and you walk looking straight ahead, but you're scanning and walking and scanning and walking. If you look down at your feet, a number of things happen. Number one, the weight of your head can propel you forward from looking down. Just the weight of your head, it's like a bowling ball on your shoulders pulling you forward. And you can also get that round shoulderedness that you see people have. So when you walk, walk, look, scan 10 to 15 feet. If there's nothing in your way, walk. If there is something in your way, slow down when you get to it and avoid it. Next slide. Mind your posture. Stand up straight so you don't get that round shoulderedness. Look straight ahead while walking and not at your feet. And when you walk, walk heel toe. So what do I mean by that? I mean that instead of planting your foot because you feel a little bit more secure, planting your foot flat on the ground, you lead with your heel and you strike when you're walking with your heel. It doesn't have to look stilted. It just has to be a striking with your heel and rolling through and no shuffling. Most people, when they say, I caught my foot on the carpet or I caught my foot on the linoleum, I don't know what happened. It must be the shoes. It must be whatever. It's not whatever. It's the way you're walking. You're not lifting the front of your foot properly. So heel toe walking. And if you leave this talk learning nothing else, the most important thing I can leave you with is heel toe walking no shuffling. So make it your mantra for the rest of your life. Next slide, please. Also avoid sudden changes in posture when you're going from lying to sitting, sitting to standing, or standing from bending over. Because very often we can get what's called a precipitous drop in blood pressure, meaning that your blood pressure is not necessarily abnormal, but when you change your position, it drops quickly and you can start walking having gotten up from standing and five steps into your walking you can get dizzy so it's better to when you stand up or you sit up to count to three and give your brain a chance to catch up when you are turning turn slowly do not whip around. Instead of doing like a U-turn, let's go back to the driving metaphor. Instead of doing like a U-turn, better do a three-point turn. And step out, stop, turn, and then step out again. Give your brain a chance to catch up. Next slide. When you are walking up and down the stairs, always, always hold on. Always hold on and remember if you have an injury or a weaker side, you go, you step up with your good leg or your good side and you go down with the bad. So how we remember that is the good go to heaven and the bad go elsewhere. Another thing about gait is that we, re as we get older, we really need to stop rushing. Don't rush to get the, to get the phone. It's not worth you falling and having a serious injury to get that message. The person can leave a message on your answering machine. They can leave a callback number. You can see a missed call and you can call them back or they can call back. But don't rush for the phone. Let the answering machine get it. And likewise, if you are at a traffic light and you don't know when that light changed, 
don't rush across the street. Wait for the next light. It's another 60 seconds out of your life, but it really is much safer. And this way, you won't get caught in the middle of the street when the light changes and feel that you don't know which way to go, to run forward, run back. Just wait for the next light, wait for it to change and slow down. So let's, now we talked about gate, now we're gonna talk about fall safety at home. Next slide. So the first thing that we're going to address in the home is your lighting. Make sure that you have lighting in your house that's good enough so that you can read, but not so much that it causes glare. As we get older, glare can become a problem, even though we really do need, as we get older, more light to see. So upgrade your lighting, so that you can read comfortably, but not so much that it causes glare. Keep your stairs lit at the top and the bottom. And the reason that I say that is because your stairs, every step looks the same. If it's not well lit, one step can just fall into another in your eyes and in your mind, and you can miss that last step, whether it's going down or going up. So light, top and bottom. Make sure you have enough lighting at each room, at entrances and on outdoor walkways, especially if you're leaving during the day and coming home at night. Make sure not only for safety and security, but for fall prevention, make sure that you have enough light. And lights connected to motion sensors, things that will go on at dusk or will sense when you are walking up to it that go on are an easy and inexpensive way to add lighting to your home. Next slide. So night lights. I can't say enough about night lights. Very, very important. Please use night lights anywhere and everywhere that you walk at night. So put night lights in the bathroom, in the bedroom, in the kitchen, in the living room, in the walkways, in the hallways and keep them on wherever you walk at night. This way you can see when you get up in the middle of the night, you're a little groggy, you're a little sleepy, you might not see that your bathrobe fell on the floor or the cat is lying in your walkway. But if you have a night light on, you will be able to see that. Now, if you look at this picture, you'll see that the night light is in the switch plate. They're very easy to get, you get them at Home Depot and they just write in the switch plate and you put it on. Now, why did I show you a picture of the night light low to the ground? Just a fun fact, having nothing to do with fall prevention, but if your, light, if your lighting is down low to the ground, it's less likely to um, interfere with your melatonin and you'll get back to sleep much easier. Next slide. So what do you, no, go back to the other one, sorry. So what do you see here? You see nothing. So this is what your bathroom looks like without a nightlight. Next slide. And this is what your bathroom looks like with a nightlight. So you see the difference in one picture you see nothing and in this picture you see everything. So very important nightlights. Next slide. Clear the clutter, as I said, most Falls occur in the walkways because of clutter. So keep your walkways and stairs. Don't put, the, don't put any plants even though they look pretty. Don't drop the newspaper. Don't leave the laundry there. When you come in from shopping or the library, put your packages and your um, books on a table or a counter so they're off the floor and out of your walkway. Arrange your furniture to give you the most walking room and give you and uh, keep cords out of the way. So let's look at this picture just for a second. And you see that in this picture, let's say I go to, I go and I take a nap and I wake up and I'm a little groggy and I have to go to the bathroom before I have to watch Judge Judy. So now I'm a little groggy because I just woke up from a nap and I have to get up. Where am I walking? So if I walk to the right, I'm walking into the piano bench. If I walk forward, I'm walking into the ottoman. And if I walk to the left, I'm walking into that box. So make sure you have enough room when you stand up to walk safely 
to the next room. Next slide. Rugs and carpets, that old cliche about removing scatter rugs. Please, it, it's cliche, but it is a true cliche. So do get rid of your scatter rugs because they can trip you up by bunching up or your foot getting caught under them. Secure large carpets to the floor and the stairs. Make sure if you have like a very large area rug that the edges are secured to the ground. Check for signs of wear on your carpet because if the carpet is frayed, it can catch on the bottom of your foot and make sure that the carpets are in good condition. There are two rugs that we do want you to have, even though you got rid of your scatter rugs, and that's one rug outside your tub and shower, so that when you step out of the tub, you can step safely and not slip on the tile, but not a skimpy scatter rug that you can throw in the washing machine. You need to have something with a rubber backing and with a little heaviness so that it stays on the floor, and when you step on it, it doesn't slide around. The other place that I like to recommend is in front of the kitchen sink because you're very often doing dishes and loading the dishwasher and water can get on the floor and trip you up and make you slip. Pay attention to your thresholds. You know, we live in our home so long and we think we know where everything is and where we put everything and we know every step in our homes and we do, but sometimes we forget. We are distracted or we are not thinking and we can trip. So in low lighting, you might not see the threshold. So what you can do for the threshold is you can make it a different color so that it's easier to see. You can put in a threshold reducer, which is like a little ramp on either side so that you don't, your foot doesn't come up to it. You can step on the ramp or you can remove it and just have the tile meet the carpeting. Chairs in your home. No rolling chairs. Do not ever use a rolling chair because you know how easily when you sit down, even if you hold on to it, you, it, the chair can still slide out from under you. So no rolling chairs. And when you're sitting in a chair and while you want to put your feet up on the desk, please do not tip the chair back. Do not tip the chair forward because it can come out from under you. The weight of you can pull the chair back and it's really very unsafe and beds, make sure that your mattress is no more than 23 inches off the ground. Please do not have a bed, even though they look really beautiful, where you need a step stool to get onto the bed, because it's very unsafe when you're going to get off that bed in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. Next slide. In your bathroom, put a chair in your shower or your tub in case you get dizzy and you have to sit down non-slip strips or a mat in the tub or the shower. And as I said, use a mat outside the tub or the shower, a non-slip one. If you use a mat in your tub or shower, make sure that you pick it up after every use so that mildew doesn't collect on the back and make it slippery when you step on it. Inst professionally install grab bars. And this is very important because a professional will install the grab bars into the beam behind the wall. And that, when it's installed into the beam, it's meant to hold your weight. Never use towel bars, faucets, or handles, or the shower curtain, or the shower curtain rod to keep you from falling, because then you will assume that it can hold your weight. And because it's not meant to hold your weight, it won't, and you'll go down even harder. I was giving this lecture in a library and a lady told me that she was getting out of the out of the bath and she needed help standing up. And when she went to stand up, she held onto the spout that the water comes out in the tub. And as she put her weight on it to stand up, it came out in her hand and she hurt herself badly and ended up in the hospital because she hit her head going down. So professionally installed grab bars in the tub, around the toilet, they don't have to be ugly. They can be, you can have ones that look like the towel bar or they are the towel bar or the soap dish and they don't look like grab bars themselves. And avoid the use of bath, oil, bath oils and salts because they make the floor slippery in your tub. Stairways, we talked about lighting on the stairways, but also put railings on both sides if you can, if not at least one side. 
Make sure that the steps themselves are not slippery. If they're slippery, put a non-slip strip on the edge and make sure that you can see the edge of the step clearly. Next slide. Avoid wet floors. Only walk where the floor is dry and clean up spills right away. So if you have a spill in your kitchen and you feel like you need to go to the bathroom, please clean up the spill first. And the reason I say that is because when you go to the bathroom, you might, by the time you come out, forget or be distracted with something else and forget that the spill is there and then you can slip. So clean them up right away. And also beware of very highly polished floors. Keep your floors squeaky clean without the sheen because the sheen can make it very slippery. Next slide. If you must use a step stool, be sure it has a high back to hold on to. So not those flimsy step stools that you see on the bottom that there's nothing to hold on to. If you need to use a step stool, no more than two steps high and make sure that it has a very high back handle around it so that when you step on it, you have something to hold on to securely. And what about laundry? So when you carry laundry up and down the steps, a number of things happen. First, you can't see where you're going because you're holding the laundry basket in front of you. So you can't see the next step. Number two, you can't hold on because you're holding the laundry basket. Number three, the weight of your of the basket with the laundry in it is like your head when I said at the beginning that your head propels you forward when you look down when you're walking. The laundry basket does the same thing. So the weight of the laundry basket can make you fall down the stairs. So what's the solution? Put, the laun put your laundry in a duffel bag or a pillowcase or a garbage bag, doesn't matter, and throw it down the steps ahead of you. When you're going back up, don't leave the laundry on the steps, put it on a counter or a table and take it up in small amounts so that you can hold on while you're carrying the laundry up the steps. And what about our clothing? Avoid wearing long clothing, long bathrobes, long coats that come down to your ankle are a hazard when you're walking because you can step on them and especially going up steps, you can step on them. So they should really be no longer than two inches below your knee. If it has a belt and you're not and the belt is not tied, tuck the belt into the pockets so that it doesn't drag on the floor and you don't step on it. Avoid loose clothing, so wide leg pants. Pants with wide legs, I know that the Palazzo pants are all back in style and they're beautiful, but they're very, very unsafe because you really can step on the, on the clothing. You can, you can step on not only the leg that you're stepping with, but you can step on the material of the other leg and you can go right over. And another tip is instead of standing and trying to get the pants on or wobbling and holding on, sit down when you put on your lower body clothes. When you put on your pants, your socks, your underwear, your shoes, sit down and then you'll feel much safer and you won't wobble as much. And pets, pets are a very big hazard for those who have them, especially if that pet loves to follow you around. So make sure you know where your pets are at all times, especially at night. And also if you're very, very busy and you're preparing, let's say, for people to come over and, and you're going from room to room, make sure you lock the pet in a bedroom just for the short amount of time that you're preparing so that this way you'll know where the pet is at all times and you won't have to worry that they're under your feet. And if you have a dog and you're walking your dog, please make sure that the dog does not pull you because even a little dog can knock you right off your feet. And always have a way to call for help. I won't go into the different personal emergency response systems because that is a 45 minute talk in and of itself, but there are all different kinds. There are all different brands. They all do different things. Some have GPS, some sense when you fall, 
some you have to press the button. You can look it up. AARP has a very nice article on this, and it can provide peace of mind not only for you that should you fall, that you have a way to call for help or a way to call a way help will always sense that you have fallen. Um, but it will give you peace of mind for your family to know that you have a way to call or that they'll be notified. If you do not have a medical alert system or a PERS, a personal emergency response system, always carry your cell phone on your person. And I mean, even when you're going to the bathroom, even when you're going out front down the walkway to get the mail or the newspaper, if you're going out to empty the garbage, always carry your phone in your pocket on your person so that if God forbid you do fall, you always have a way to call for help. You might slip on something, some animal might run in your way and you don't see it. And if you don't have your phone, there's no way to call for help. So keep it on, on your person at all times. So that's really all about home safety. Let's move on to feet. So there are many problems that can cause you to fall having to do with your feet. So some people have, tingling or neuropathy or lack of feeling in their feet. They can have muscle weakness, arthritis, um, things that create foot deformities like bunions, corns, hammer toe, um, nail, even an ingrown toenail can cause you to have pain and walk incorrectly. All of these things and toe things like toe deformities can cause you to not be able to walk properly and not walk heel toe. And when you can't walk heel toe, you're more likely to trip. So visit your podiatrist at least once or twice a year to make sure that your feet, your toenails, and anything on your feet, like calluses and bunions and things like that, are all taken care of and your feet are in good condition. And what about what you wear on your feet? So all safe footwear should fit surely should have an arch. So those ballet slippers that have no arch in them are really not very good for your feet. Your, the proper alignment for your back is that your feet have an arch. So if you wear flat shoes without an arch, it can really hurt your back and also hurt the way you walk. Make sure the treads of your shoes are not worn down that if they have laces or ties, that they're tied properly, that the soles are bendable and flexible so that when you walk heel toe, the shoe will bend with you. So no wood bottom shoes, no cork bottom shoes. And most important thing that I can tell you is that all your shoes should have a back, including your slippers. If you have mules or flip flops, they're really very, very unsafe. So what, kind, what other kind of footwear do we need to avoid? We need to avoid high and skinny heels. We make sure that your heels are no more than two inches and that they're fat, that they're thick, that they're not the kitten heels that are so pretty um, because you can wobble on those and go right over. Make sure your shoes fit properly and there's enough room in the toe box, but that they're not too tight or too loose. Soles need to be flexible. Do not walk around in stocking feet only, unless those stockings or socks have those grips on the bottom that help you walk safely and you won't slip. But again, I reiterate, when you wear backless shoes like a mule or a flip-flop, you are scrunching your toes without knowing it because you need to keep that, foot, that shoe on your foot. And when you're walking, the shoe can come off completely without walking, without warning. And that can really make you fall. So no backless shoes under any circumstances. Even, you know, even if you have sandals, your sandals are fine, but they really just need to have a strap around the back. And what about our vision? So everyone should have an annual dilated eye exam after the age of 50 because the dilation of your eye allows the doctor to see more of the back of your eye and the retina and see if there are any problems around the eye that are not, that are detectable by him that you don't necessarily feel. So, you know, we say with a mammogram that, you know, early detection is our best protection. 
So the same with eye exam. The doctor can see things before they become a problem for you. So a dilated exam once a year. If you wear glasses, the most important thing that you can do is clean your glasses because if there's smudges all over your glasses, you're not going to see well and things might blur. When you're walking up and down stairs, if you wear multifocal glasses, please take them off. Because if you look down through the reading part at the step that you're walking on, it's going to look distorted and make you not be able to see where you're supposed to put your, your foot. So instead of looking through the top and bending your head over, which puts you in a precarious position of your head pulling you over, we ask that you take off your glasses. Taking off your glasses, will you may not see great, but you won't see distorted. So take off your glasses. Beware of reduced contrast sensitivity. So what do I mean by that? As we get older, we need more light to see, as I said when we talked about lighting. But as we get older, sometimes things that are the same color or the same um, a similar color, not the same color, but a similar color, look the same to you. So for instance, if you have in your living room a brown um, table, coffee table, and a green rug, if there's not enough lighting, they may look the same to you, and you'll walk right into the table and trip. So we had reduced, con impaired or reduced contrast sensitivity. So be aware of that, be aware of the lighting and make sure, especially that you are thinking about that, especially at sunset, when the light is going down very, very slowly, that you might not be able to see easily where one step begins, where one thing ends and the other begins. So likewise on steps, when we're walking up and down steps, every step is exactly the same. If you don't have enough lighting, you're not going to see where one step ends and one begins. If you're walking in and out of a darkly lit room, a dark room to a lit room or a lit room to a dark room, stop and count to three and give your brain a chance to catch up because the change of light can be very startling for your brain. And even though you keep walking, you can get dizzy five or ten steps into your walk. So when you're walking into a movie theater or out of a movie theater, just stay wide and count to three. Wear sunglasses during the day to protect your eyes. The sun causes a multitude of damage to your eyes and think of, sun, of sunglasses as sunscreen for your eyes. Um, you can get one, make sure that they have UVA, UVB protection and you can get ones that have um, polarization so that it can separate glare, separate, it can overcome glare by separating the light for you, okay? And glasses with anti-reflective coat, coating for night driving will give you sharper vision and, and stop that, um, that look of glare of the oncoming cars. Next slide. And people ask me all the time, what on earth does hearing have to do with falling? Well, the truth of the matter is that when you can't hear well, especially when it's imbalanced, you have difficulty detecting sounds around you. So let's say you're standing on a corner and you think that you hear a siren and you think the siren is coming from behind you. So you step off the curb, but the siren is really coming from your right. So you step off the curb and you walk and you can get hit because you didn't realize that the siren was coming from behind you. So your brain is really working so hard to try to figure out exactly where the noise is coming from. And because it's working so hard to do that, it also doesn't have enough resources to give to your balance. So if you have a hearing problem, get it checked out and get a hearing and get a hearing aid. Next slide. So this, in this slide, um, this cartoon, the lady says to her husband, she says, oh my goodness, turn up your hearing aid. He said, your money or your life, not your money or your wife. Next slide. 
And the dentist, hearing dentists, what do they have to do with falls? Well, the truth is that poor oral health and more and more and more studies are coming out. Things like gum disease, tooth loss, dry mouth, all can put you at risk for frailty. These things, we're not 100% sure why, but some of these things can make you more frail. Just having gum disease can make you more frail. The added bonus and that and the frailty can make you fall, can cause you to fall. And the other added bonus when you go to a dentist that very often the dentist can see things in your mouth before they become widespread in your body. So sometimes they can detect um, a cardiac problem by the germs that are in your gums and things like that. So that's just an added bonus, not having anything to do with fall prevention. But do go to your dentist at least twice a year so that you have your teeth cleaned and checked. Next slide. And what about medications? So medications include over-the-counter medications, um, over-the-counter supplements, and vitamins that you take. And the, any of them can cause dizziness, drowsiness, or confusion. The more medications you're on, the greater your risk. The highest risk is when the medication is started, stopped, or the dose is changed because you don't know how you're going to react to that medication or the change in dosage. So stay close to home when you're changing a medication or starting a new one or stopping one, just to make sure that you're okay. Alcohol and use of medications is a no-no. It increases your risk of falls um, in anybody, not just in older people. And alcohol, as we get older, is detoxified in our body much longer, takes much longer than it did when we were younger. So when we were younger and we had a drink, an hour and a half later, we were okay. At our age now, it takes about four hours for it to leave your body. Make your pharmacist your friend. Very often they know when and how to take the medication better than the doctor, not what medication or the dosage, but which medications can safely be taken together. Keep a list of all medications with you at all times with all three over-the-counter prescription and supplements and keep it updated and talk to your, your doctor or your healthcare professional about your medications and whether they can interfere with one another and cause you to fall. Next slide. What about osteoporosis? So keep your bones and keep your bones strong and avoid fractures with calcium, because calcium is what our bones are made of, vitamin D, which is the key that unlocks the process, and exercise allows you to lay down the bone and build strong bone. Next slide. We measure the thickness of our bones. Think of an oak tree. That's 100 years old, that's nice and thick on the inside. Now think of the same tree that's termite eaten. And that's what your bones look like with osteoporosis. The only way to detect this is with a bone density test. So make sure that you get a bone density test either through your gynecologist or your endocrinologist or your internal medicine, your uh, primary care physician. Next slide. Always check with your doctor before taking supplements. They used to suggest supplements for everyone over the age of 60, and they no longer do that. You really should only take them if you need them because they can cause calcifications in your blood vessels and yes, from your diet. You should be getting a certain amount, about over a thousand milligrams a day, and everyone knows the good sources of calcium, which are um, dairy products, salmon with bones, any kind of bony fish, um, soy, tofu, nuts, and dark, leaf, and dark leafy vegetables. Next slide. And vitamin D, which we always get from the sun, and that's really the best source, except now because of sunscreen and we're so afraid of skin cancer, we wear hats and sunglasses and sunscreen and all different kinds of things that keep the sun from getting into our bodies. So you can also get vitamin D from, you, from your diet. And good sources are sardines, fatty fish, salmon, tuna, liver is a great source, and so are eggs, but not the, not the white. The yolk is a good source of vitamin D. And remember to always check with your doctor before you take these supplements. They can draw levels and tell you whether or not you need more 
than you're getting from your diet. Next slide. And exercise, you can do balance and strength exercise and moderate exercise can help build bone. It's the weight that builds the bone. So weight bearing exercise is very important. Um, things like gardening, dancing, walking, even vacuuming are good, all good exercises and good for your bones. Or you can work out with a trainer like Ruth Bader Ginsburg or take a strength and balance class. Next slide. And this lady said, oh, I went to an aerobics class the other day. I stretched about, I fell over a few times. It was agony. And by the time I actually got my Leo taught on, the class was over. Next slide. So what about walking? Walking is the best um, weight-bearing exercise and it builds lower body strength to catch you if you start to fall. So it has a lot of different benefits. It's weight-bearing, it's aerobic. And the latest studies have shown that people who have arthritis and chronic pain do much better in the long run in terms of dis not having as much disability if they walk and if they keep moving. If you have a problem with walking, you see in the picture that these people are using walking sticks, very different than a cane. These just take the edge off. They're like ski poles, but just for walking and hiking, and they can really help you with, keep your balance when you're walking. Next slide. What about community safety? So when you're out on the street, just I said at the beginning with balance and gait, scan every 15 feet for road hazards in the road and on the sidewalks. When there's no sidewalk, walk facing traffic and always use the crosswalk and press the button. Now, most people think that the button is for changing the light to their favor. And that's really not what the button is for. So another fun fact having nothing to do with fall prevention is that the button does not change the light to your favor faster. But what it does do is when the light does change, it adds time to give you more walking time to go across the street. So do press the button every time. When you're on a corner, make eye contact with the driver. Make sure that you have a silent agreement about who's going first. Look for hidden dangers and parking lot, things like in parking lots, drivers backing up and hidden driveways. Wear white or bright colors at night and choose well-lit paths in the evening and the night. Next slide. And avoid distracted walking. People, I saw when I was walking in the city, um, one day a guy was looking on his cell phone and he walked right into a pole on, on the sidewalk and it just, I, I couldn't believe it. So avoid distracted walking, ask yourself, if it's really so important that you have to be doing it at that moment, and if you do, stop walking. Don't just keep walking. Next slide. When you're out, avoid wet floors. And only walk where the floor is dry. So if you go to Costco or stop and shop and you walk near the flower display, make sure that you're aware that, the, that people pick up flowers and they're wet and it gets on the floor. So walk around that or well, don't go near it and also if you go to a restaurant or a museum or a party or a wedding or some affair make sure that you're aware of highly polished floors like dance floors or restaurant floors next slide please and sleep <coughs> excuse me so not enough sleep can increase your risk of falls because it may, you can be very tired and a little dizzy during the day, and you're less steady on your feet if you haven't slept enough. And the research has shown that people who, who slept less than five hours were more than 10 times more likely to suffer from recurrent falls. So try to make sure that you get enough sleep during the day, and if you have trouble sleeping, speak to your healthcare professional. Thank you. What about inclement weather, managing snow and ice? So make sure that your walkways are clear of snow and ice. If you have to walk outside, you can use something called a spike tipped cane where the, the spike is retractable and that can dig into the ice and give you more traction. Or use something like yak tracks or grip backs, which you put at the bottom of your shoe, as you see here in the picture. 
and that will give you more traction when you're walking outside. Just be careful to put them on when you, as you're leaving because if you walk across a wood floor or a tile floor, they can be very slippery. Next slide. The snow and ice is the only time when I don't want you to walk heel, heel toe. I really would like you to walk the penguin walk. So what is the penguin walk? Think of a toddler when they're learning to walk, how they stand up and they spread their feet wide apart. And when they walk, they plant their feet and sort of waddle a little from side to side. That's the way you walk in snow and ice. Take small steps, plant your feet, and walk very carefully. Wear sunglasses for glare in the winter, dress in layers, and the best thing that you can do is stay inside. Next slide. When you're walking outside, don't forget about wind. If you hear that there are high gusts of wind, be very careful when you walk outside and don't forget about wet leaves. Next. So what about hot weather? We always talk about cold weather. We don't talk about hot weather. You're more prone to heat stress. And as we get older, thirst mechanism, is not as good as it was when we were younger and we don't always know when we're thirsty. So that you must really drink a lot and drink even when you're not thirsty. And how do you know if you're dehydrated? So the way to, be, the way to know is beware of your urine color. Your urine should be almost colorless. If it's very dark, you know that you're dehydrated. And sometimes you see people stumbling on the street and you can, um, think that they're drunk or whatever, and sometimes they're just dehydrated. Next slide. So how do you prevent it? You take sips of fluid during the day. Water is the best thing. If you're excessively perspiring, you can take an energy, uh, a, an electrolyte sports drink like Gatorade. Um, sweetened beverages, tea and coffee and energy drinks are all not recommended because they can dehydrate you. Next slide. And what about infections? Infections can cause you to fall because infections in your blood, infections in your urinary tract, infections of your lungs, like a, a upper respiratory infection. All these things can lower your blood pressure. They can make you lightheaded. Um, they can cause you to be dizzy and it can add to confusion. So all these things are something to be, to watch out for as well. Next slide. So, I added these slides because I think that this is very important and it's also the hand, on the handouts that will be available at the end. That if, how do you get up from a fall, from, safely from a fall? First thing is don't panic. Take slow deep breaths until you calm down and then do a body assessment to see if you can move. If you can move, then you follow these steps. And I'm not gonna go into them because you can see them on the handouts that will be sent to you after the talk. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So here are some tips and tricks for getting, for fall prevention. When you get in and out of a car, instead of putting one foot out or one foot in, when you're getting in a car, back yourself up and sit yourself down on the seat and swing your feet around together. And this way you won't put strain on your back and you'll be doing, and you all the effort will be in your upper thighs, and it will help you get in and out of a car. Swing your legs around together. Don't use one leg to get in and out. Use a car cane, which you can see this lady holding on to that goes inside near inside where the car uh, door handle with the with the um, the door closes. There's a little um, hinge and you can put it in there. Use, a, use walking sticks, as I said. Use a reacher for low items only, not for high items. Eat frequent small meals to get your blood, keep your blood sugar normal, not a full meal every two hours, but frequent small meals every two hours. Find a balance and strength program. And don't be afraid to talk with your healthcare professional about fall risk and prevention. Everybody thinks that if they tell their doctor that they fell, that the doctor is gonna send them to assisted living or a nursing home. And that's not true because very often there's something that can be adjusted like a medication 
or you just need some physical therapy. Next slide. So we are at the end. In summary, be aware. Walk like you drive. Slow down. Don't rush. Walk heel toe and scan while you walk. Walk heel toe and awareness allows us to make good choices. Next slide. Next slide. So leaves are supposed to fall, people aren't, but there is one time that we do want you to fall and we want you to fall hard. And that's when you're falling in love. So thank you so much. You've been a great audience and I'll take any questions in the time that we have left. Thank you, Lori, for the, your extremely informative presentation. If anyone has any questions, you may enter them in the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. Somebody just mentioned as community safety, if you see a problem like a pothole in the parking lot, let the owner know to protect your safety. Yes, that's a very important point. And if you do see things that are hazards, you really can let um, the owner know, or you can let the town board know, or things like that. Um, somebody asked, will you be emailing us the handouts? And yes, we will. Okay. Does anybody have any further questions? Change the photo of man putting on shoes. Oh, I have to change my photo. I'll go back and look at that. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> Thank you. What if you have no confidence in your doctor? That's a very, very good and important question. And the subject for another talk, like how to work with your healthcare professional. But I will say, if you have no confidence in your doctor, that you really need to find another doctor. Because if you have no confidence, you're not gonna listen to what they say. And if they don't have time for you to answer your questions and things like that, you need to find somebody that you feel comfortable with. So ask your friends, ask your relatives, ask other healthcare professionals that you know for recommendations and find another doctor and ask that your records be sent to the new doctor. But do find somebody that you feel comfortable with. It's a very important thing. I need orthotics, but have tried to have several doctors try to make them, but I can't tolerate them. Is there any particular type of orthotic that may, might work better? The type of material, for example. Um, I really don't know the answer to that. You can't tolerate them because you can't tolerate the material. It irritates your foot, I'm assuming. Um, I think that that's a question that I really am not familiar with orthotics, but I can try to find the answer out for you and see if um, there are some materials that are more tolerable than others. If you email Mather Huddle, they will get the question to me and I will get an answer for you. Yes, you can email Mather Hospital at northwell.edu with any questions that you may have. We're going to try and answer one or two more, but any further questions, please email us at Mather Hospital at northwell.edu, including your question about orthotics, and we'll have Lori answer those for you. Okay, do we have time just for the going over the heel toe walking once more? Yes. Okay, great. So I see that somebody asked for that. So heel toe walking, when you walk, you step out and strike down with your heel and roll onto your toe and walk that way. So you put your heel down and you roll through to your toe. It does not have to be stilted, it's just a natural thing. The other thing that you do when you heel toe walk is you swing your arms. Swinging your arms will help you keep your balance and give you 
better momentum. So when you step out with your left, with your right foot, your left arm goes out. And you step out with your left foot, your right arm goes out. So it's a fluid motion of strike, of walking, stepping down with your heel, rolling through to your toe, and then the next one down with your heel and through to your toe. And practice because it really does make a difference and you will not trip nearly as much. Thank you, Lori. We are out of time, unfortunately, so if we did not get to your question, please email us at matherhospital at northwell.edu, and we'll be sure to get those answers from Lori for you. We will email everyone who attended the three handouts that Lori mentioned. She wanted to share with you on preventing falls, and once you exit the webinar, you'll see a link to complete a survey. If you could please take the time, it's very brief. Your feedback is extremely important to us, and there's one area where we ask for new topics that may be of interest to you, and we do take all of that feedback seriously. So thank you again, Lori, for joining us, and thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to her presentation. Thank you so much for having me.